Okay. Well, sit, 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 sit. Yeah, this is a really important topic, and it's going to be uh, really fun to talk about it with this particular group of panelists, which we expanded with Jennifer. Um, and let me just quickly, besides just the title, uh, tell you what these people do, and I'll elaborate further. Mark is with Clicks, which is a secure browser, basically, that's very much a, 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 an Alberta project, um, but he'll tell us more details. Kevin has written extensively about many internet issues, a very well-known and respected journalist in the United States, columnist at the New York Times, like Alexandra said, um, and, and known for his strong opinions, which I really like, and I hope he'll demonstrate <laughs> that here. And similarly, the other Mark with a C, uh, Mark Rotenberg, uh, who's a longtime friend of mine uh, of Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, which is probably the most longstanding and expert group in the U.S. focusing explicitly on the issue of online and digital privacy, which he's written about and, and you know, this is actually not a topic for our discussion here, but the well-discussed FTC complaint against Facebook, which there's now a lot of discussion, will they get this gigantic fine? Mark was deeply involved in initiating the action that led to that investigation and, and settlement way back when. And finally, Jennifer, also another great journalist uh, who many of you know from her longtime presence at DLD, uh, is she's not a privacy expert per se, but uh, she is a super smart person who has some really good ideas about this topic, so that's why we added her. So, you know, I, I'd like to start with Mark Rodenberg, if I could. You know, when, when you think about this issue of, um, and I'm, I'm talking loud, I tend to, if I, I think it's okay, right? Uh, it's, it's hard to hear up here. Uh, what, when you look at GDPR as a phenomenon as, and as a possible role model, and if, especially from your vantage in Washington, what is the most important thing about it that you see? Well, thank you for the question, David, and thank you also, DLD. It's wonderful that we're having this conversation today. Uh, the short answer to me is that in the GDPR, I see the response of democratic institutions to one of the biggest challenges that technology has created, which is the risk of the loss of privacy. So we can say these elements of GDPR are good, these elements of GDPR raise some challenges, both statements would be true, but what's most remarkable is that here is an effort by national governments to find at least a partial solution to the question of how we protect privacy in our modern age. And the corollary, of course, is that we have a great deal of work to do in the United States to at least engage the challenge. Do you see GDPR as becoming a kind of, let's just go right to the heart of this discussion, a global role model for other countries and regions? Well, I do, actually. I was at the Privacy Commissioner's Conference in Brussels in October, and we had you know, the um, head of uh, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and they were essentially saying to the Privacy Commissioners of Europe, they were prepared to comply irregardless of what happened in the U.S. But here's the interesting question. If U.S. firms are going to comply with the GDPR and provide baseline protections to the European consumers, don't they have an obligation to provide at least the same level of protection to the U.S. consumer? And of course, that's where my organization is deeply involved. We think these companies absolutely need to provide for the U.S. customer base the same protection. Okay, one last thing. Do you believe that within a relatively near term there will be legislation in the U.S. that governs online privacy in a manner comparably uh, comprehensive to GDPR? Let me begin by saying, if you work in the field of privacy protection in this era, you have to be an optimist. Otherwise, you don't get up in the morning. So I always believe, um, I believe something is possible. And I think this year in particular, in part because of GDPR, in part because of the California 
privacy legislation, which creates a forcing function, and also because it's a genuinely nonpartisan issue. Yeah. I think this is one of the areas where we could actually see the Democrats and the Republicans work together. And just for the Europeans who might not have followed U.S. politics, California has introduced a law that, while not as comprehensive as GDPR, is quite closely related to it and has made a lot of waves in the U.S. that a state would have gone so far forward, particularly the state that is home to Silicon Valley. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I want to go to Kevin next. Sheryl Sandberg said in her speech just now, which probably everybody saw, protecting privacy and showing relevant ads are not at odds. We can do both. How do you feel about that? Does that is that a compelling statement to you? Fascinating. Well, I think what what is at the heart of this question is, is the ad-based business model compatible with privacy with respecting user data. Um, I'm not sure it is. I mean, I think that we have now an ad infrastructure, not just Facebook, by the way. This is, this is you know, Google with DoubleClick. This is the sort of data broker industry that feeds a lot of the online ad business. Um, what we've seen is just a tremendous uh, um, level of sort of infrastructure built up around the collection and monetization of personal data. And, um, Zainab Tufekci, who sometimes writes for uh, the New York Times, has a great line where she says, we built a dystopian surveillance state to sell ads. Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's one sort of interesting perspective on this, is that all of this infrastructure is, um, could be used potentially very badly by authoritarian regimes or, um, or other sort of... Well, is being used or badly is being used. by authoritarian um, regimes. And it was only ever really meant to, to sell things, but it's also useful for a multitude of other things, some of which are, are pretty bad. So in other words, you're skeptical of the statement protecting privacy and showing relevant ads are not at odds? I'm skeptical, yeah. I think I am. Okay. Um, but but let's, let's also think about what we mean by relevant. I mean, we had the advertising industry did not start in 2004 with the invention of Facebook, right? We had, we had, we've had advertising for centuries. And the way that you got relevant advertising, quote unquote relevant advertising to people, was that you put ads in the places where they were likely to go. If you wanted to advertise to, um, to women, you might put uh, an ad on HGTV or on the Food Network. If you wanted to advertise to young men, you would put something on ESPN or in Sports Illustrated. Um, the idea of relevance does not, um, sort of is, is something that we have a long history with, and it doesn't need to be targeted in the ways that it is right now. On the other hand, we have seen that targetability makes advertising more profitable, and that's why Facebook is the most profitable large company anywhere. Um, and I, I was going to go to you, Jennifer, but if you'll indulge us, I want to go to this Mark, because he specifically has thoughts about this advertising point. Quickly describe what Clicks does and how you respond to what Kevin just said. So first of all, what is Clicks? We've build a browser, a search engine, and a privacy protection all in one suite. Uh, you should download it. It, it really protects you. Um, and we monetize with ads, actually. We, we are thinking about a second revenue stream. We believe we want to also have a model where customers can directly pay. Um, but both models should have 100% privacy. I tend to disagree with the notion that an ad ecosystem is not possible in a private world. Um, um, it is one of these myths that the big companies tend to tell us. There is no innovation possible if you don't have um, all the data of the world. Uh, how could you personalize a search or a browser experience if you just don't collect everything about the user first? This is a lie. It's just the 20-year-old model um, of the internet and it's how the engineers have been educated in the last 20 years. And it's incredibly hard for the engineers to shift their mind and come to a model where you come to a place and say, I only collect what I really need, and I leave everything that I don't need at the client device. By the way, we've solved that, well, the Americans have solved that when they send rockets to the moon, because they actually didn't transfer all the data back, <laughs> all the intelligence was at the edge. Um, Clicks has this principle, we put all the intelligence at your device, and you can do everything on that device. It's just a bit more complicated, and it requires a different thinking. I'm not 100% um, 
convinced myself we should use all that intelligence to sell ads. Um, I think personalization, a search engine, a browser is a better use. Um, but I, I want to get out of our brains that anything becomes impossible if we have more privacy. This is one of the biggest lies and one of the biggest factors that stops privacy becoming mainstream. It's a bit harder work you have less of a margin because what actually will stop is you don't have a data monopoly which creates a natural monopoly. So for a company, it's a weaker position. But technically, if you have good engineers, nothing will fall apart if we have an extremely strict privacy. And just coming back to the original topic, this is why I believe we need stronger privacy protection than GDPR today. Okay. Uh it was interesting that the first time I think I've ever heard, and I think about Facebook quite a bit, as some of you know, Sheryl Sandberg explicitly acknowledged in her talk today that their business model is being questioned. That was a new development of her in her speech, and as some of you know, the New York, the, the Time, Time Magazine has a, a cover story, right, uh, uh, Roger McNamee, which is a preview of his new book with this title, Zucked. Uh, in which he has a line that he says, Facebook and Google are artificially profitable because the costs of their system are not fully borne by them. And this, he, by that, he means exactly what Mark was just uh, talking about. Um, so Jennifer, I know you're an American living in Paris. You have a, a very global view. How do you see this, this issue of GDPR as a plus or minus for Europe? Well, I see it, uh, and, and I'll just, uh, you know, uh, by way of, uh, I've been living in Europe for 33 years. I have a French passport. I identify as a European, and I see GDPR as a very good, positive thing um, because it encapsulates key, a key European value, which is data privacy. Yeah. Um, but I also see it as a huge opportunity for Europe because why should we believe a company like Facebook to protect our data when there is no government oversight and they only are answering to themselves and their shareholders, right? And on the other side of the coin, we've got China that is, is, is being very overt about using technology to spy on its citizens. We have an opportunity in Europe to create a third way and use technology, AI and blockchain, to um, you know, let people know that if you are using European technology, if you have Europe inside rather than Intel inside, that your data is protected. And this is, this is something that you know, I think all Europeans can get behind. And then instead of having all of our most brilliant technologists, Jan LeCun, who works for Facebook and others, going off to work for American and Chinese companies, we inspire them to stay here. And they help create a desirable future, not just for Europe, but for everyone. So you really think GDPR could be almost a branding advantage for Europe? Yeah, but it can't be just law. It has to actually be encompassed inside the technology in order to really protect people. But Jennifer, you must often hear the argument which is made by a lot of, especially European startups, that GDPR has added unnecessary overhead, particularly for small companies, and that it is in some cases a competitive disadvantage. So. Do you have, think there's any legitimacy to that? Sure, I'm sure this you know, causes some headaches for startups, but again, I think I see this as an opportunity. And, and, and you know, just bef uh, a few sessions ago, in the, on the other stage, we had a woman on the board of Deutsche Telekom urging all the startups in the audience, work on blockchain, work on technology to help protect privacy. This, is, this is, can be Europe's edge. Yeah. Okay, good. Mark, what do you think of that? Well, I think it's a very good proposal, and I think it also speaks to a point that Mark made earlier, which is that privacy and innovation are not in conflict. In fact, I think in a lot of areas of the information economy, you can't have innovation without privacy. And by that, I'm thinking, for example, of encryption. I mean, my organization, Epic, started 25 years ago over the freedom to use encryption. And we were talking about the ability to have private communication, but of course we were also talking about the ability to have a secure platform that enabled trust. What are we all talking about today? We're talking about the loss of trust. 
The cornerstone, the foundational element, is of course the technology. Now the question is, what role does law play? My view is that GDPR incentivizes good technology because one of the first things it does is to say to a company, maybe you should think twice about collecting all this personal data. And if you choose to collect all this personal data, maybe you need a good way to protect it. And if you don't have good answers to those questions, you probably shouldn't collect the data. But guess what? There are lots and lots of ways to innovate that don't require collecting extraordinary amounts of personal data. Or there may be ways, I mean, there are those who argue you can collect a lot of data in a way that respects the control of the individual. And that's especially one of the promises that many innovators who are thinking about blockchain-based systems for the future talk about quite extensively. Well, let me take another category. I think blockchain could go both ways, frankly, as a, as a privacy technique. But the technique of de-identification turns out to be extraordinarily important because if you can make de-identification work, you can actually use very large data sets and not run the risk that someone could be adversely affected, which is of course what most of privacy law is concerned with. But it's a hard problem. And as computing increases and as sets are joined, the ability to maintain anonymity you, you know, could be diminished. Now in my mind, this is a great challenge. You create a regulatory regime that says, limit personal data, use aggregate data, the key technique will be around de-identification, and the companies that solve that problem and successfully implement that solution will do very well. Okay, did you have something you wanted to say about that? Well, I, I think there are two issues. One right is data collection, and the other is data retention. And we, today, I don't, if you were there to hear Kai Fu Lee speak, we heard about AI and neural networks and types of technology that actually do require vast amounts of data. It, if you want um, Google Translate to work well, it has to ingest millions and possibly billions of conversations to have the training data to make the algorithm work so that it can then translate effectively. But the key thing is that it doesn't need to keep that data forever. Once the neural net is trained, um, you can get rid of the data and still keep the model that provides the value to, to customers. So I think that is, is sort of shifting, that attitude in Silicon Valley is, is beginning to shift where keeping, storing data forever is being seen as a liability rather than an asset um, because you can have breaches, you can have privacy issues. Um, it, I think the case for collecting data in an, in an AI-driven world is a lot stronger than the case for keeping it. That's really an interesting way to think of it. So many issues, and I do want to hear audience questions and comments, but, but Mark, and, and I'm, I'd like you to sort of respond to this, Jennifer. One of the things you talked about in your remarks just before, was, to summarize, would be, you know, the values of the engineers in the end are what are, are going to be most determinative, right? Uh, and there's a lot of talk about Silicon, particularly in the United States, about Silicon Valley having gone off the rails from a values point of view. I think Kevin's written about that. Uh, is, is that the right lens? Do you think that ultimately we can shift the values of the entire industry to the world's advantage? Or is that, is that just something that a few insurgents are going to do? Uh, I think we have to. I, I'm, I'm an engineer myself, I run a technology company, but you don't want engineers to control where the world is going just because they can. It's just we're the worst people because we actually like to explore the edges and we like to cross bridges. Uh, we don't think too much about the consequences. The discussion about privacy, the discussion about data is not a discussion that should happen on a developer conference. It should not even happen on this conference. This should happen in, in the feuilleton of newspapers. It should happen in the main stage of political discussion because this is how we shape our um, our living together. So before this panel, there was porn on, on this stream slightly confusing um, <laughs> I, I think we should have a discussion whether I can go to a company in Israel and America and buy the data who of you watches porn I think we should have a discussion right now we don't have that discussion I can simply go I can give you five phone numbers of companies they are stock listed and I can buy who of you watches animal porn or whatever that was 
you, you might not be ashamed of it. Some might share it. If you're an artist, you might feel great about sharing it. Most of us don't feel so great if I tell you I can buy this data. I can today go to the market and buy whether you've done an HIV test or not. I can because I'm an engineer. I shouldn't. And that is a discussion we should bring to politics. This is a discussion that impacts all of us. And the last thing we ever want is that technology people just do stuff because they can without any oversight. It's really nice that you injected that way of thinking into this discussion. It's really not a tech issue. It's an issue about our civic culture in a digitized age. And, and, and that is a very healthy thought. But Jennifer, any thoughts about yeah. what he said or this question of, of ethics in particular? Yes, well, I mean, th these discussions are going on at a very high level of, um, in Brussels right now. Um, and, and I know that there are very well-respected technologists and um, investors and, and all kinds of, of, of people who are advising the European Commission and looking very carefully at this issue um, because it is such a core European value. Yeah. And yes, we have our differences here in Europe, but we do have these shared values, democracy and data privacy and human dignity. And there is, is real discussion yep. about encapsulating that in the technology and the law. And, and I think we are well advanced over the United States in, 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 in that area. And wouldn't you say probably in Europe, the idea that this is an issue of civic culture and, and, and societal well-being is better understood than in the United States? Yeah, I do, because people in Europe are, are very concerned about maintaining, you know, uh, their, their, the things they value the most in life, and, and they want to make sure, because when we talk about AI defining kind of humanity or the future of humanity, they want to make sure that we have the future that we desire. And so, so this, this is why not only is the talk <laughs> going on at the European policy level, but we now are starting to see venture capital funds in London who will only invest in startups that are working on technology to protect data privacy. So this, this, this is not just theoretical, you know, blah, blah. This, this, is, this is a real movement that's starting to take hold well, it, here. it may even, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes up in the successive <laughs> panel on this stage about Web 3.0, which involves a lot of blockchain technology, it is a lot of the reason why that seems so promising is because of its capability to achieve some of these things. I wanted to throw out an idea that, that came up on on stage in the other room earlier from Kai Fu Lee and get Mark Rotenberg to discuss it, but any of you, uh, maybe also Kevin, uh, he said something that I bet surprised many when he, at, toward the end, he said, we basically have a choice between privacy or openness and security. Now that is not widely said that basically security for society and even to some degree for individuals is achieved at the cost of privacy. And I wonder, were a lot of people here surprised to hear him say that? Were, how many people here were surprised to hear him say that? But heard it. Were you guys surprised? Did you, well, what do you think of that? Let me just say, I recently read his book and I was going through it and I was, you know, alternately impressed and scared as he set out a vision of AI. And it was partly for this reason I think, first of all, we need to understand that privacy and transparency coexist in democratic societies. In fact, one of our measures of the health of our democracy, I would say, is the ability to move between a private realm and a public realm. If we can do this freely without constraint, we understand the concept of freedom. You don't have this experience, by the way, if you're in a prison or if you're in an autocracy, because the people who govern your lives determine whether you have the ability to retreat from that type of intense transparency. Now, here's my concern, and it's not in, intended as a criticism of, of Mr. Lee. I think there is, in the technology, a drive toward an efficiency that seeks to extract data from individuals. Shoshana Zuboff has written about this in her new book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, and her point is that absent some proactive measure, economic systems will gravitate toward the outcome that he described because it's efficient, yes? 
So we are going to be faced, I would say, with ongoing challenge. In a sense, the GDPR may be seen as, you know, humankind's first attempt, first meaningful attempt to resist the control of machines as they permeated our lives in the 21st century. Uh -huh. this is, uh, yes? Well, well said. Yes, well, I suspect there are many more battles ahead and I think they will become more intense over time. Okay, I wanna hear from you all, but I wanted to ask Kevin to comment on one thing you said when we were talking earlier today. This issue of the developing versus developed world, consequences of some of these discussions, could you just re retrieve that, that thought or shall I? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a big worrier, as anyone who knows me knows, and I, I'm, I'm sort of worried um, that what we're heading toward is a kind of bifurcated privacy world where people in the developed world who can afford privacy conscious technology, who can afford an iPhone, who can afford um, you know, secure messaging systems, will have a better and, and more robust privacy than people in the developing world who are mostly using Androids, who are using you know, software with leakier permissions. Um, I worry a lot that we're turning sort of privacy into a luxury good, and so I think for the the companies and the organizations that are working on privacy conscious technology, it's really important not just to develop that stuff, but to get it wide enough distribution so that, so that everyone can take advantage of it. Um, one thing that I think doesn't get enough credit, and I criticize Facebook for many, many, many things, but I think the decision to have WhatsApp which is a free app, also be end-to-end -end encrypted, um, was, a, but it was, was a really... it was always end-to-end -end encrypted. Well, but they could have changed that, right? Yes. I mean, they acquired the company and they could have, it would, they would be making a lot more money but on it. But finish your sentence. The decision was what? The decision was to let it stay and to end encrypted. And, and you, 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 at you, the you, cost of, you know, ad revenue. And I think that was a, a good decision and an important decision because now, you know, a billion odd people using WhatsApp in the developing world have a kind of encryption that they probably wouldn't have had otherwise. It's being highly challenged in many countries, of course, as you know. Uh, because of its political consequences. Um, who has a question? Oh, Esther, I'm sure it'll be a good question. So go for it. We got the mic right there. Yeah. Identify yourself, though. Um, Esther Dyson, adventure, former chairman of ICANN, et cetera. Uh, actually, former chairman of the EFF. So vis-a-vis -vis the developing world and privacy, and then I'll ask my question. You fundamentally, as long as someone can come and knock on your door in the middle of the night, you know, you okay. cannot escape. And I think people in our world way misunderstand that reality. People do not live on the internet. They live on, in villages with police. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was- Hold the mic a little closer to your mouth. Sorry, the, oh my God, that does make a difference. Yeah. Okay. The question I wanted to ask was, are we confused, I think, the word advertising has a different meaning in the US where you know it's it's at least sanctioned versus in Europe and I think the challenge is less advertising and, and less privacy it's manipulation and I'm worried that we're gonna get really good at protecting people's privacy to the extent they want that but we're going to continue to use all this stuff to manipulate them and that's far worse hmm. manipulation is when advertising is effective. That's a provocative way of putting it. Jennifer, you have any response to that? You're nodding, that's why I call I, I'm nodding because I, I agree, and I, I, I think it's something that we do have to be aware of, and, and you know, all of these wonderful internet tools that we thought was going to bring us all these wonderful things, and they have, have also brought us a lot of terrible things. I mean, elections are being manipulated, and, and um, we have revenge porn, and we have all kinds of horrible things that have come up, um, and, and I, I do think we have to worry about them. I don't know how to fix it, um, but... Well, it's healthy we're having discussions like this so much more, though, now. Don't you think, even, Esther, that we're, we've made some significant progress in terms of, it's essentially a values discussion, as Mark, I think, really correctly pointed out. Um, so who, who else has a comment or a question? Okay. Can you get the mic? Yeah. And tell us who you are, please. Thank you. I'm Cornelius. Does it work? No. Yeah. I'm Cornelius. I'm a PhD candidate in Freiburg. And I have a question concerning privacy and innovation. Today, Sheryl Sandberg said that Facebook is a wallet garden, of course, and the data we put in there stays in there. 
But what do you think of a concept of um, patterns on data, like tear down this walled data after five or six years or something to allow more innovation from smaller companies? In other words, force something like Facebook to share the data with others? Exactly, like we have it within medicine, like you have the original thing and after, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, other companies are allowed I mean, to build. That's a very loaded question considering the Cambridge Analytica history. That <laughs> it's exactly what Facebook has been criticized for allowing. But any thoughts from any of you? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's the problem is that <laughs> these, these walls are leaky in ways that we don't understand. Um, Facebook has been through now you know, many cycles of criticism for sh actually sharing too much data. So the walled garden argument was sort of a relic of an earlier uh, line of criticism, which was that these platforms weren't open enough. Yeah, she was saying that as an ironic commentary on the current environment, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would make a point also to something Kevin said um, oh. earlier. Not all business models rely on the collection of personal data. And my particular concern about Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp was that WhatsApp was following a different business model, it was subscription-based, it was very successful, it had very good privacy, not only end-to-end -end encryption, but it wasn't extracting user data uh, for advertising. And you see, when Facebook was allowed to acquire WhatsApp, you lost competition in the messaging space, you lost innovation, and you created more incentive for the model which you proposed, which is basically to say to the incumbent, we need access to your data. I think this is not a sustainable approach. I think it puts users at risk, and I don't think, incum I don't think competitors okay. will be... We, unfortunately, cheated. I see zero on the monitor, but I want two quick things. Do they now blend the WhatsApp yes. user data to the degree they know it with Facebook and other data that they possess about yes, those which, individuals? Which they said, by the way, they would not do. Okay. Which is one of the reasons we've gone okay, out. Okay, final question. Do you think they should break it up along the lines yes. of the services? I think that uh, WhatsApp and Instagram should be spun off. And I think you may see in the next couple of weeks from the U.S. Federal Trade Commission a very big announcement about the future of Facebook. And I should just say, he knows more about what the FTC is about to do than most. <laughs> Anybody have any final comments they've been eager to say that we didn't get to? I apologize. There's so many great things to say, so little time, but a great panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you.